Welcome everyone. Welcome to the last seminar on assessment rubrics for teaching. Our presenter for today is Terry Harden. Uh, Terry is a learning and teaching with technology consultant for LSNA. In her role, she helps instructors design effective teaching strategies and learning activities and also support the use of technology tools uh, during available to LSNA. Terry's background is in teaching and learning. She has 12 years experience in teaching English and speech communication in high school and higher ed. She holds a graduate degree in pedagogy in English from University of Michigan and graduate certificate in educational technology from Michigan State. Okay, uh, thank you, Siba. Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out today. Glad you didn't have to go out in the rain. Uh, my background is in K through 12 education. I started out teaching in high school where you use rubrics. I, we use rubrics for everything, all the standards that we have to meet. Um, and then when I went on to teaching in college, I brought my rubrics with me. I can't imagine teaching without rubrics. But as I've been at U of M, you know, I come across a lot of faculty who don't use them and they really just haven't had the time to think about rubrics. And someone the other day asked me what a rubric was. She said, I, I've heard of them, but I don't know what they are. So today's session is really an introduction to rubrics. We're just gonna start at the beginning. Um, if you know a little bit about rubrics, then I, I still think you'll get something out of the session, but I think it's just a, it'll be a nice, place to just pause and really go to the beginning of what a rubric is. Uh, before we get started though, I have a really quick poll that I'd like to take. I just kind of want to know where you're at with rubrics. And there's a question, you know, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about a rubric? So if you see that poll on your screen, if you can just answer that, I'm just curious as to what your mindset is today. I'm seeing a theme here. It looks like almost everyone has chimed in. Okay, great. I'll share the results with you then. Um, can you see the results, Siba? Yes. Okay, so I wish I had more time to create rubrics, this is true. Uh, it is time consuming. They don't always have to be time consuming, uh, but a more complex rubric, it is going to take you time. I think ultimately it saves you time, but it does take time to set up. And then a few of you, what exactly is a rubric? Yeah, def definitely. So you're in the right place today. I will um, stop sharing that and do let me know if that doesn't leave the screen. Is that gone from the screen, Siva? For me, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so then today's objectives, I will define what a rubric is, identify the different parts of a rubric, and we'll talk about situations in which rubrics can be useful. Um, and then we're going to look at four really classic styles of rubric, uh, styles that you'll probably typically see, but I think it'll be a really good starting point. I think there's like an infinite number of rubrics out there that you can that you can steal, honestly. Uh, we'll do a little breakout session where you'll get some time to talk to a partner and just kind of think through a particular objective and, you know, get to share some ideas with somebody else. And then we'll talk about norming a rubric. And that's if you're going to be working with another person and you're both going to be scoring with the same rubric. And then finally, we're going to follow up with it's actually going to be a separate video because we do want to take you through how you create a rubric in Canvas, how you grade a rubric in Canvas, and then how you can align with your course outcomes. And we created that as a video um, because you may not be ready for that yet, but when you are, you'll have that available. So here I have just the most basic definition of a rubric. I just want you to read that and just think to yourself you know, what words maybe jump out at you? Uh, maybe scoring. What is scoring? Is that grading? Is that the same as grading? What do we mean when we say we score with a rubric? Or maybe the word component. 
component meaning that you're parsing out parts of an assignment. There's specific pieces of an assignment that you want to evaluate. And then criteria, you know, that's the standard, that's the evaluation. What does that look like at a certain level? That's the evaluative piece, that criteria. And here, you know, you see this little rubric here. Um, one of the comments people make about rubrics is that they're very rigid, that everything is laid out so concretely. And that's true. Um, you can't put everything you want in a rubric, but it's, it's by breaking it down into separate components that you can really grade more fairly, more easily, accurately. Why would you use a rubric? Um, well, really helping students understand expectations that you have. A rubric is, it's designed for the evaluation portion. It's not the part of the assignment where you're explaining what the assignment is, that narrative around the assignment. It's how they're gonna get a grade. And quite frankly to them, that translates into a letter grade. For you, you're just trying to assess their ability. You wanna help them improve. You want them to see where they're at. For them, they're thinking a lot about grade and that in a way that's useful because it gets them to look at the rubric, but they won't be able to say, I didn't know I was being graded on this because it'll be on the rubric. Rubrics will help you grade consistently, um, help you avoid bias. So let's say for example, a student had a, a big assignment and they were just really creative and you got really excited and maybe inflated their grade a bit. But if you really took the time to break it down component by component, maybe that wasn't inflated grade for them and, and it wasn't an equal assessment. Um, it can help students clarify, like what is the important content? They learn so much, but what's the most important thing that you want them to be able to do to demonstrate to you? And then, you know, you'll wanna review the rubrics with the class, even if it's a simple rubric for like an everyday type of assignment, uh, particularly if it is a rubric for a high stakes assignment, then you definitely wanna, you know, walk through that rubric and talk about all the different parts and make sure that they do understand the rubric and that they will be evaluated on what they're learning in class. It's an easy way to give them specific feedback instead of just looking at like an entire piece of work and trying to remember all the things you want to tell them. It's nice if it's all laid out for you and you can, once you become familiar with a rubric, it'll be easy to score on that rubric. And then, you know, finally, I think most importantly, it's going to help you improve your instruction because at a glance, you can look at a rubric and you're consistently scoring on them. So you'll see, you'll see patterns. Students are really weak in a certain area. And as an educator, that tells you, I have to go back and teach that. And you can actually blame it on the rubric too. You can uh, tell students, well, <laughs> I know you don't want to do this again, but after looking at these rubrics, I can see that, that we have an opportunity here to improve your learning. It's just an area of weakness for everybody. So rubrics are very valuable for that. All right, so now we'll take it to the beginning and we're gonna look at the parts of a rubric and identify those. The first part of a rubric is the task description. So we have it right here at the top. If it's a smaller assignment, like you know homework assignment, you might just have a one paragraph task description but if it's a major project, let's say you're assigning your students a podcast assignment, there's going to be narrative around that and context. You might have an assignment sheet that maybe has two pages of writing, you know, hey, students, you're going to be doing a podcast. I want you to do this and that. It needs to be this long. You're going to give all that information. That's the assignment. That's the task. But that's not the rubric. So the rubric does not stand alone. It's not intended to stand alone. The rubric is, this is how you're gonna be evaluated. Whether that translates into a grade or not, because it doesn't have to, um, this is how I'm gonna evaluate it. It's not gonna tell them what they need to do and how they need to do it though. This is just how they're being scored and how that aligns to your course outcomes. So next we have the scale. Up at the top, you'll see level one, two, and three. And this I wanna point out isn't points. It's not 1.2 point, 2 point, 3 point. This is, this is like a level of ability and it's going in ascending order. So it might be you know, beginning, developing, advanced, 
whatever terms you want to put in here. And these terms can be kind of loaded. I think there's an infinite, infinite number of terms you can use. And you'll have some discussions if you're working on a rubric with someone else. But this is about the levels, um, where they're meeting, where they're meeting the um, outcomes at, not necessarily points. So this is the scale. And then this column here is for criteria. And you'll notice it's broken down into different dimensions. The dimension would be listed and then you would have a short description of that dimension. And so for example, if I said um, surface features, you're being graded on surface features, then what do I mean by that? Uh, punctuation, spelling, mechanics. If I said thesis statement, you know, a explicit arguable claim, you just define it briefly. And then with some rubrics, you're actually going to be describing what success looks like at each of these levels. But these are going to be the basic components of a rubric. You don't have to score. It doesn't have to equate to a grade. Typically, they do, but you don't have to. Um, and then again, remember, the rubric doesn't stand alone. It's just the last piece of the assignment. It just lets students know how they're being evaluated. All right, so we're going to jump in and we're going to talk about some particular kinds of rubrics. And the first rubric I want to talk about is a holistic rubric. This is a rubric that will be more for lower stakes assignments. It might be for like everyday homework assignment. And this type of rubric is a rubric where you're looking, you're looking at it holistically. You're not parsing out components. Really, you're just going to give, basically, you're going to identify what it is you're looking for, and then you're going to evaluate the quality of that in one dimension. This is good when there's not, you know, a right or wrong answer, so it wouldn't be something you would use for maybe a formula problem. But when you really just want to look at the overall quality of work, um, like let's say you want your students to write a reflection during class. Maybe they write reflections on movie they watched or something that they read. And you say, this is what I want you to do. I want you to summarize the piece you watched. I want you to use two examples. Um, I want you to, to relate it to the content of the course that week. You know, whatever that is, you're going to describe that for them. And then they have to, they're going to meet that at some level. So let's take a look at what that would look like. I have an example. I have two examples of holistic rubrics. And the examples I'm going to use throughout, I'm going to have some really simple examples of making back breakfast in bed, just to simplify the content, not to make it fuzzy there. But if we look at this top rubric, you'll see that there's, um, there's this description at the top. Uh, all food will be perfectly cooked, presented, presentation surpasses expectation, you know, da 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 da. This is the top achievement level. Now we aren't parsing this out by like making one about food and one about presentation, but basically this is the thing that you want them to do. And then how well did they do that? So this is much easier to grade than a rubric that's broken out by different components. In this case, we have different levels and it says score. So this is a rubric that's intended to give a score or points, which you can do. You don't have to, but if you want to, you could say that Here's what you do. If you do this, you're only going to get one point. If you want to get four points, if you want to get full credit, this is what I need to do. I mean, think of a student asking, How, what do I need to do to get an A? We try not to get them to ask that question, but we know that that's on their mind because that's you know, pretty important to them. What do I have to do? You know, This is what you have to do. And then if we look at the second rubric, this is another holistic rubric. This is just a different way of laying it out that I think is easy, even easier. So here's ultimately what we want. This is what you need to achieve and how well did you do it? So here, again, these could be points. It could just be like a scale where you're just gonna mark it off. Maybe they just get five points for doing it. You know, and typically a holistic rubric will be like that. You do this, you do your breakfast in bed, you get five points, but I'm going to tell you how you did because I want you to know so that you can improve. Here we have the terms, you know, emerging, developing, meeting, exceeding. These are the terms that you just have to think about with your own teaching. Um, for example, sometimes it, 
you might have failing over here. Some people don't like the word failing. And there's some words that might seem kind of loaded. So you have to think about how you want, you know, how you want to explain those different levels to students. Um, the advantage of a holistic rubric, they're really quick, especially if you lay it out like this. Um, it's, they're easy, you can write on them. If you're printing them out, you can create these in Canvas, you know, quite easily. So this would be for, like I said, an everyday homework assignment, a reflection assignment, something like that. Okay, so now we're going to the other extreme. And we're gonna talk about analytic rubrics, uh, the mother of all rubrics. These are the most complicated rubrics. And these are rubrics that, you know, typically we see with high stakes assignments. Assignments where you want to assess many different components. So think about an end of the term project where students are gonna be demonstrating, you know, things that they've learned all semester. They're very time consuming to, to create, but ultimately they will save you time. That will make your grading so much easier and more fair. They're really great to use if you are working with other faculty or GSIs, or maybe you're leading a GSI team. Um, when you have when you have more than one person grading on an assignment, I mean you really want them to interpret the rubric the same way. You want them to be grading the same way. And these, because they're more detailed, the analytic rubric, it's gonna help you do that. Um, if you wanna see profiles of strengths and weaknesses, this will really help students when they look at that rubric, they'll be able to see, this is where I need to improve. You know, Here I'm doing great, but over here I see that I need to improve. It's a lot easier to give them detailed feedback instead of just looking at a piece of an assignment, a task, and then trying to think, how am I gonna explain how they did? What, am I going to remember everything that's important? Am I going to grade my students fairly? And then if you want students to self-assess their understanding, these, these analytic rubrics are great. So let's say you, you did give something like a podcast assignment to students. Well, maybe they can go through and evaluate themselves on the analytic rubric first to see, you know, how well am I doing? How do I, have I met, have I met all the criteria that I need to for that particular assignment? So let's take a look at what this looks like. We'll first look at our breakfast in bed analytic rubric. So here you'll see there is a scale. You're typically with an analytic rubric, you're gonna have a scale. You might have three or four different levels. Now, the one, two, three, four, as I said to you, don't think of these as points, although you can assign points here. Let me explain what I mean by that. Let's say that the top points they can get for each of these categories, each of the criteria is four points. So that makes it a 12 point rubric. And let's say you give this assignment and typically students get A's and B's on it. But if you start scoring and you, and you assign two points to developing, and you may have a lot of students get two points for developing, and that's six points out of 12 and that's failing. Do you really, does it really mean failing to you? So that's what I want you to be careful of. We're gonna look at how you can assign points here in a way that makes sense like mathematically, but it's just something you have to think about. So there's just make that distinction. The scale doesn't necessarily mean points. The scale is just showing levels of ability. Um, so, let's, so we've got our scale going across and you'll see that this also says score. That means that this rubric is designed to give a score or a grade. Scoring a rubric typically refers to, you know, you're here, you're here, you're here, you're here. Giving it points will make it a grade. So you'll need to score to get their grade, but you don't necessarily have to grade them. Sometimes you just want to give them feedback and you might give them credit for, for doing the work. Now, if we come down the criteria column, then you can see we've got three criteria. And we look at the first one as food. Um, so what does a student need to do to be exemplary? Let's say this is going to translate into a grade. Well, the food needs to be perfectly cooked and seasoned. Um, did they do anything extra? Is it really exemplary? Uh, if, if you score this student, let's say that we want each of these to be out of 10 points. It's for a 30 point rubric. And let's say we're going to score the student gets, gets like a six. And they say, why, you know, why did I get a six? Um, why didn't I get my full credit? And then you can point to somewhere over here. This is where you fell. This is what it looks like at that level so that they understand, okay, what do I need to do? 
um, to get that A. And I know I, we try to avoid that conversation with them. They can say, what do I need to do to get an A? And we can say, this is how you can improve. When I look at your rubric and I see scoring over here, that tells me that you know, you've got room to grow. These are the opportunities for improvement. So this is the really basic analytic rubric, but I want to show you, I'm going to take you to uh, a real rubric because I think that will be helpful too. And this is just one that I've used and I want you to take a look at it. Uh, and it looks like a lot, right? But this is for uh, a research paper. So this is a comp one class where students have been learning these things all semester long. And you'll see that there are, this is a scale of four levels. Notice that this starts at four, which is the best, and it goes down. There really is no rule about, you know, ascending or descending order. And quite frankly, I don't really see rubrics more one way than the other. Sometimes they start with, you know, the highest possible score to the lowest, sometimes the opposite. I think for you, it's just important to be consistent. So if you're going to start, you know, if you're always going to start with the highest score, then do that just so you don't confuse students. Here we have criteria for this particular assignment. There's 10 criteria. Now, this was something that I graded on, and each of these was worth 10% or 10 points each. You don't have to weight everything the same. I mean, it's easy to do that. And personally, me, because math is not my strength, I tend to make things out of 100 and whole points, and uh, it just makes it easier for me. And I think for students, too, because I think what students think about is a typical grading scale. You know, what is nine out of 10? That's 90%. That's an A minus. They can kind of wrap their head around that easier. So I've got my 10 criteria. And then you'll notice that I put these in categories. And the reason that you might want to do that is to make sure you're weighting accurately. So for example, I want content to be worth a little bit more than, than the writing conventions or organization. And it will help you to see, are you weighting things the way that you want? You'll see here's the thesis statement, here's the criteria, here's a brief description. And when you're creating rubrics in Canvas, there's a, there's a place for that, you'll be able to do that. And then here, what I've done is just describe what does it look like at each level? So let me take one that's kind of easy to look, look at. So if we looked here, um, APA document design. So let's say a student, what does a student need to do to, to score high? What if they scored low? It might be because they didn't have in-text citations. They didn't have proper formatting, missing a references page. I mean, that's pretty bad, right? But it happens. So they may be scoring over here. And they want to know why, you know, why am I not doing well on my assignments? And here you can easily show them there's some, there's some issues. And there's always going to be overlap. So for example, if a student really lacks in-text citations, they probably are going to get hit on research integration, right? Then there's probably some critical thinking issues. So these, you can't divorce them all, but it, it does help you show a student, this is the area that you need to improve. And when you tie these to their student learning outcomes, it's gonna help you, you know, collectively as a class see, where are my students consistently weak? Um, like, you know, when I taught this class, APA document design is really hard for students and they don't wanna go back and relearn it, but I can say, look, you're all scoring really low. And that means we ha I have to go back and reteach this. Um, so, so this is a, um, something that someone's actually using in college. Um, and another thing, okay, so this is what I wanted to show you. I took this rubric here, put it in Canvas, and these are the first two levels. What I want to show you is how you can work with points. If you're going to be assigning a grade, you're going to need to have points. So the same rubric, if they're get at this level, that's between nine and 10 points, um, that would be translated into an A, right? That's an A minus or an A. If they're at this level, seven to eight points, that's a BC level. In Canvas, if I clicked this, it would put the 10 here. If I wanted it to be nine, I'd have to do that manually. But then this, this area here is where I can add comments. So 
you can very quickly, you know, if this is a paper or another assignment, you look at the criteria, you figure out where they're at, you make some comments, and you can move through this quickly and really give students targeted feedback, give yourself feedback, and also tie it into your course outcomes to see, you know, how students are doing at each level. Another analytic rubric then I brought in, this is a chemistry lab rubric. So this is something students are assessed on, um, you know, maybe on a weekly basis or maybe a few times during the semester. And it's really about their lab technique. You can see that this instructor, instead of points, is gonna weight things, but out of 100%. So this is probably a weighted group in Canvas. Um, and then there's five criteria, they're all weighted equally. So what does a student need to do to be prepared? Well, over here, did you read the experiment? You ready to work? Do you have your notebook, your lab coat, your goggles? That's pretty important. And if consistently that student is in here and they're scoring here, you know, it's pretty easy for them because this is pretty practical, easy for them to, to go, okay, I see what I need to do. You know, this is important and it's something that, you know, you really want drilled into students, that lab technique. So this is a, um, you know, for chemistry lab. Here's an example of a podcast assignment. And you'll see that um, this is out of 100 points, but there's only five criteria. So each is worth, they're equally weighted. So each one's worth, you know, up to 20 points. And you'll see here that if I was just scoring this, you know, it would be, I could click if it was a clickable rubric, you know, the student falls here, 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 just for feedback, just for assessment. I could have a column over here for comments. But if I do want points and I need points, if I'm going to give a grade, then it looks like this, 18 to 20, you know, 16 to 17. And again, they can kind of do the math when you keep the math simple and they, they can understand, okay, what do I need to do to get top marks here? And this, the text here is, is actually can be really tricky to write because you have to be succinct. You can't put everything, every little thing you want them to do in there. It's not possible, but you have to decide, you know, what are the important outcomes for my course? What do they need to demonstrate for this course? And then that's what you create in here. And if you're working with another person, it is it is time consuming. And I know a lot of you said that in the beginning, like this just takes time. But if you are going to be assessing this, you know, every semester, it's so worth the effort because it, it's going to save you so much time and just make your grading not just efficient, but um, fair, you know, really fair for the students. All right. So I want to take a minute and think about the process of constructing a rubric. It starts with setting aside some time, right, which is the hard part. But reflect on the assignment. Why would you give this assignment? Because that's going to help you think through the criteria. What happened last time you gave it? Were there areas of weaknesses? Were real misunderstandings by students? What did they complain about? You know, think about that. What are your expectations for the assignment? And then, you know, how does this tie in to your learning outcomes? If it's an analytic rubric and it's a, it's a higher stakes assignment, you're going to probably be tying in quite a few of your learning outcomes. If you don't have your learning outcomes explicitly written out for students, and maybe you have six to maybe 12 of them, that's kind of typical in a college class. I think it would start there. You have learning outcomes. Um, I just know a lot of people don't have them written out explicitly. If you do that, that's, you know, that's where you start. And then you make sure that your rubrics address that so that you can look and by the end of the semester, you know how well your students are meeting those particular outcomes. And again, you know what to reteach. So after you've done that, then start, you know, putting them into groups, uh, maybe weighting different groups. How many components do you really need to parse out? You know, maybe just three or four, maybe you need 10. Uh, think about how you would label them, how you would describe them, and then build the grid or build the rubric. And, and I say this because you really need to know what you're trying to do before you look at the kind of rubric that you want. Um, because maybe, you know, you don't need an analytic rubric. If you don't need one, don't use one. And there's a lot of different rubric types. You know, we'll look at more today. Um, but 
sort of like doing the outline before the essay. And sometimes people say, it doesn't work for me. It may not work for you. One thing I definitely recommend is that you don't go into Canvas and try to build a rubric before you really know what you're trying to build, because that will be really frustrating. So do that first. One type of rubric, depending on the assignment, is a checklist rubric. And this is a rubric that is a time saver. This is the type of rubric where you really just want students to do a task and you really aren't evaluating them on how well they do it. Kind of like, you know, going into a chemistry lab, right? Student walks in, they need their, maybe they need their book, they need their goggles, they, they have to do these certain things and I'm just going to check it off. Um, not looking at quality, just habits that you want to build, or maybe just you know, it's maybe you're at the formative stage of learning and you just want them to do certain things. So it might look like this. So here's our breakfast in bed checklist. It might be that you've got a column for redo. I need you to do these things. If you can't do this one, I just need you to redo it. I'm not gonna give you a bad grade or, you know, maybe just doing it, you get five points. But I just need you to do these things. But maybe uh, if you skip something, like if you don't put your goggles on, you, you get zero points because that's so important. We're working with caustic chemicals and you have to, you know, I have to train you to do this. So I'm going to check these off. If you miss that one, you get a zero for the day, that type of thing. So checklists can work well in sciences. I know these are used a lot in the medical field. Um, if you're in the humanities, maybe not as much, but think about, you know, could you create something simple that's just telling students what you want them to do? Just do these things. Now here I have, and I know this looks really complex. This is the um, this is a checklist, check boxes within a more detailed rubric, and this is showing one criteria. And so we're just looking at the top level. This is for a film presentation. This this is the type of assignment where. This is a group assignment, students watched a film, they're giving a presentation to the class. This is really hard to evaluate, right? Because you get one shot to watch them and you know you might be taking notes and writing comments, but the more you do that, the more you can't watch them. There's no replay unless you're recording it and you probably aren't, but you need to get, you need to check these things off really quickly. So using the check boxes within a more detailed rubric can work. Again, it, it takes a little time to set it up, but once you get it, it's great. I, I used to teach public speaking and there's a lot of speeches to grade and it's really hard to do it without these kind of detailed rubrics. But let's say, you know, a student does his presentation. This is 20% of the grade, maybe 20 points. And it needs to be five to eight minutes long. It was only three and a half. So maybe I marked here, but maybe the presentation was great, you know, really well developed, well presented, gets high marks here. I say 18 out of 20. Well, why didn't I get 20? I would did a good job. But yeah, but you're, it was only three and a half minutes and you, you left out a lot of content that you could have put in there. So this is something that, that while it take a little time to develop, you can really check the boxes quickly to get through the type of task where you, you really are watching somebody maybe do a type of performance where you don't have the opportunity to go back um, and maybe not even remember what they did. Now I'm going to talk about single point rubrics. And I think that this, I think I love single point rubrics, especially if you are teaching in, in the humanities. I think these can be great. And this really gets at simplifying a rubric. So kind of like the holistic rubric where you're really going to describe what you're looking for. And you can break this out in different components, but you're giving a description of what you want and you really are not using this you can use it to grade, but it's typically not using for give, giving students a grade. It's using, it's used for assessment. So for example, like um, let's say a rough draft, your students are turning in a rough draft to you. You don't wanna give them a grade at A, B, C, D. You don't wanna score on a gigantic rubric, but what you wanna give them is feedback. But you don't just wanna write something on their paper. You wanna give them really targeted feedback because that, you know, that's part of the course. You've got learning outcomes and you wanna know how well they're meeting each of those outcomes. Um, it's when you don't want them fussing over a grade. Um, you may have assignments where they really wanna argue about their grade or they wanna compare themselves to someone else and this will keep them from doing it. So let's take a look at how this looks with our breakfast in bed rubric. 
So basically you'll see, we've got different criteria. So unlike the holistic rubric where it's just like one snapshot, you can break this down into the criteria you want that's aligned with your learning outcomes. So if we look here, food. Okay, this is what we wanna see. Are there concerns? Is it advanced? And you can think about what words you like for that. But this is gonna show where the feedback, where you're gonna give them feedback. Um, you can also put the criteria first and the other two columns after. But you know, I might say, well, you know, the the um, patron asked for eggs sunny side up and you flipped them and the yolk was hard. And so that's, you know, that's a concern. You got to work on that. Maybe they did a great job and that was a beautiful sunny side egg, sunny side up egg, which is actually really hard to do. Uh, and maybe there were flowers. And so you did you did great on that. This is something where you might just say rough draft essay. I'm going to give you 10 points for giving me your rough draft. Here's the criteria. Here's what we've been learning in class. Here's our student learning outcomes. This is what I want you to demonstrate that you can do. Now, how well are you doing it? So if a student says, well, let's say this word like the APA formatting, here's the concerns I have. Here's, here's what's not happening. Then the student knows what they need to do to improve. So I think that this type of rubric it, it simplifies it, but it breaks down the different components of an assignment and allows you to give feedback. And if you're doing this in Canvas or you know any way that's electronic, keep in mind that you can you can kind of create this rubric with standard responses because think about how many times you say the same exact thing to each student. So you could copy and paste, you know, maybe you have examples of how to do better. You can copy and paste those from your main document and that can make it even easier. Um, it can be something like something they did in class and you're just writing a few notes or you could make it more detailed just depending on you know, if it's a high stakes assignment or if it's more of an everyday assignment. So the single point rubrics, I think, um, I, I love them. So really think about using those. And then here's a, something uh, more of a guided rubric where this is for a class discussion. So again, this is the type of assignment where, you know, you may not give this to, this is probably something you might use with your GSIs or maybe an upper level student, uh, but they're going to lead a class discussion. And that's kind of a really common practice. I noticed that faculty have different students lead the discussion of the day. And this is telling them, you know, what the expectation is. This isn't all the context around it. You're going to have a conversation about it, but this is what you expect. Like you have to give the material ahead of time. So students are prepared to discuss. These aren't weighted the same either. This is the total maximum points. I think this is out of 20 points. So three points for preparation, four for content, but you can circle things here. Like, you know, did you summarize the discussion or was it balanced? Maybe there was two students that took over, um, communication skills if you want to assess that. But this makes it easy to just kind of check off, to make some comments. Once you know your rubrics and you're familiar with them, it's, you know, it's easy to kind of go back and forth. I always struggled doing this electronically, um, this type of rubric. I just found it was always hard for me to look at a student and go back to the computer. I found it easy to print and write out if you're in a face-to-face -face class, um, you know, which we will be in the fall. But you can certainly, if you have these rubrics put into Canvas or some electronic format, you can grade electronically if that works for you. So um, scoring guide rubric. And then here I'm just showing you how in everyday rubrics, how you can take an assignment. And this is an example of an in-class assignment where students are, they're doing a particular task. It's already been described to them. They're getting together, they're working. This is something they're gonna spend a, maybe half a class period doing. And okay, they understand what they need to do, but how do they get credit for that? What do I really expect? What am I gonna be evaluating? And so I just translate it into a rubric. Um, for example, in this particular assignment, they were learning about brainstorming. So I needed them to turn in their brainstorming because I needed them to actually do it, to write it out. Now, I'm not really assessing them on like how well they did it. I never would say that to a student, but I just want to give them credit. But in my experience, they will look at this more than anything. They're like, what do we need to do? Oh, wait, we need a brainstorming chart. Oh, wait, we don't have the creative name. And these are the things that are important to me. I don't need to, you know, create a big long rubric where I'm, I'm giving them specific feedback. It's, they're at the formative stage. I want them to do it. I wanna give them maybe verbal feedback for that. 
So think about, you know, at the end of your task description, can you create a simple everyday rubric that makes it easy for them to know what do we need to do? And then they, they do it, especially if there's points assigned. And I find that assigning points really helps. Okay, um, just super brief, I, I want to touch on a topic called norming. If you are using a rubric with another group, like a group of GSIs or another group of instructors, you're grading the same assignment, but different people are grading the assignment, you'll want to go through a process of norming the rubric. And this is just simply a process, we don't have to think about it too much today, where you get student work and you grade it without anybody knowing how you're scoring, and you go component by component, like person A starts and says, this is how I scored, and person B says, this is how I scored. And then you talk about each of the criteria and say, how did you, are you scoring in a similar way? It's hard to be identical, but if somebody is giving really low scores or really high scores, how are you interpreting the rubric? It's just a process by which everyone evaluates the language on the rubric. Does it make sense? Do things need to be reworded? Are we being fair and consistent? Um, just something to keep in mind. Um, you can learn more about this process if you are grading with a group of people. So I just want to keep that in mind. And then um, Canvas rubrics, as I said, what we've done is we've created a video and I'm going to send you the link, but it's right here. It's going to show you, you know, when you're ready to create rubrics, if you haven't worked with Canvas before, how to create them, how to grade with them. And then it's going to show you how to tie them to your course outcomes, if you'd like to do that, so that you can see like across the board how students are meeting outcomes. That'll be available to you, so you can just watch that whenever you are ready. Um, some good resources here, some good books to check out if you're interested in rubrics. And, um, and I know we're just about at the hour. So if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to us. You'll get the slides. It'll have our information. You can, um, you know, just contact us. We can help you or sit down with you. If you just want to think through designing a rubric, we can do that. Um, I know we're at the hour, but I do have time to stay. So if there's anybody that, um, I don't know if there's any questions in chat, if you want to hang on or anybody just has a question for me, hang out. Otherwise, uh, thanks for coming. Have a great day and then look for that email from me.